This podcast is intended for educational and informational purposes only and does not replace independent professional judgment. Land Gorilla Inc. makes no representations, warranties, or promises for and disclaims any express or implied warranties related to content. Before acting on any information, you should consider the appropriateness of the information as it pertains to your unique business needs. Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jamie Lee, and this is the Construction Lending Podcast, where we are sharing information, trends, and best practices around all things related to construction financing. In today's episode, we will review the top five housing-related headlines from the past month to analyze and discuss the potential impact to construction lending. Joining us today to help break down these headlines is Shannon Ferris, Director of Strategic Relationships at Land Gorilla. Shannon, thank you for joining our discussion today. Hey, thanks for including me. So Shannon, there are a number of headlines that was released in the past few weeks outlining the dire need for more housing and not just more housing, but affordable housing at that. A Bloomberg headline outlined that U.S. housing affordability hits the worst point in nearly four decades, and Redfin CEO also made a comment that the real estate market is at a standstill. He stated, the people who need to sell won't do it because they don't want to give up their mortgage, and the people who normally buy can't afford it. What do you make of all this, Shannon? Well, I think I would agree with the comments in both those articles. Um, the guy from Redfin, you know, hit it right, the nail right on the head, you know, people with a 3% mortgage, why would you want to sell that property and purchase up that's going to come with a 7% mortgage? And so those economics, you know, don't, don't really seem to, don't really seem to work. And so um but that being said you know we have to look at uh um look at all the people that do not have a three percent mortgage because they're renting uh, mm-hmm. and they're struggling to get in as a first-time home buyer and yes it would be a seven percent mortgage but um you just have to look at the uh new home sales you know that just came out today actually came out today just in time for your podcast and, uh, you know, new home sales uh, for the month of July, I think we're like 714, 715,000 for the month. You know, those are, those are very high numbers for the uh, tracked home builders. And so they're not having any trouble at all selling those homes to people trying to break into housing. So uh, I guess there's two sides to this. Yeah. You know, Shannon, this is really interesting because, you know, for example, my sister and her husband, they have 20%, uh, you know, quite a bit saved up and they're looking into putting 20% down. But the problem is, is that one, they can't find a house that they like. Two, they can't find a house that they can afford <laughs> in terms of the monthly mortgage. He always tells me, you know, he's like, I don't want to be house broke, meaning, we bought this house. We have the dream that everyone's trying to achieve, but yet we can't afford to live in this house. Is that something that you're seeing regularly? Oh yeah, I think that's that's uh, that's really not uncommon at all, and that's why most financial <clears throat> advisors are telling people if you're going to buy a home, you're going to ratchet ratchet up your primary housing expense. You need to do it with no debt, mm-hmm. no credit cards, no car payments. Get rid of all your debt you know, before you buy your first home. And many people, you know, they make that as a mistake. Right. And so um, I, I guess that's one, you know, piece of ad- advice that you could give. Uh, the other would be, you know, don't, um, don't miss out on the opportunity to buy an existing home that simply needs to have work done to it. Uh, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, because renovation loans, can be used in purchase transactions and very commonly are. Uh, FHA 203K loans can be used to purchase a home that needs a new roof, you know, and so you do it concurrently. 
homestyle renovation, choice renovation, all of those uh, renovation programs allow for um, the, the product to be used as a purchase transaction. And so more and more, we're starting to see more customers that are crowding into the purchase market, you know, because there's limited housing inventory, um, much of the housing that's out there that, 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 that you might look at, it might be 40 years old, you know, it might be on its uh, second roof and now it's time for the third or the fourth roof, you know, stuff like that. And so, but that is one way that, you know, you can overcome that issue of, you know, difficult to buy a house that needs a brand new roof because the appraiser is gonna notate it in the appraisal report. And that will be a repair required repair item by the mortgage underwriter anyway. You know, right. the repair has to be made or, you know, a funds escrowed for it or in some way it's, it, it's gonna have to be addressed. So. Uh, but when you stop and think about all the housing inventory uh, in the United States, how much of the existing housing inventory in the United States, what, what's the age of that existing home? Well, probably 45% of all those homes, you know, those houses are more than 40 years old. Wow. Wow. And so when you that's stop and think about that fact. way, gee, you know, that's a house that's going to need some major remodeling, might be a great location, might have other, you know, strong attributes. So I would encourage, uh, you know, people that are trying to break into the housing market to, you know, consider the options with 203K uh, or choice renovation or uh, I I any of these uh, uh, renovation programs, uh, you know, you should be looking at. One thing that seems like it's not just the the inventory that has everyone worried, but it's also the interest rates. You know, another headline that made news was uh, Fortune highlighted in an article in the, about the housing market, about the lock-in effect where homeowners are uh, secured historical lows during the pandemic and now are reluctant to sell their properties. Um, according to Sean Dobson and the CEO of Amherst, he quoted, Financing at 3%, then jumping rates to 6% is the same as burning homes down from a supply perspective. You know, Shannon, how will the lock-in effect impact construction? Well, uh, in the new home construction market, um, I, I think what he's saying is true. There, there's a lot of truth to what he's saying there. I wouldn't disagree with it at all. Um, but I think the maybe the other side of the coin is the fact that um, in new home construction, um, let's take the publicly traded tract home builders, for instance, um, they are building and selling as many homes as they can possibly uh, build uh, mm -hmm. at meeting that demand. And I think the reason for that uh, despite what you're saying about, yeah, interest rates are up, they're elevated. Why would people want to give up a 3% mortgage to get a 7% mortgage? Uh, and the answer to that is that is, is there are millions of people out there that do not have the 3% mortgage. They don't have any mortgage. And so just getting into the housing market as a first time home buyer, you know, the, the, that, that borrower is part of the 5.5% million in housing units that the country is currently short of. So um, yes, it is a higher payment. It is a higher struggle, but there are millions of people that are uh, striving to get into the housing market because of the, of the current shortage. So I think until we see that change, uh, home builders are gonna have a field of dreams and um, I think ultimately that's, that's gonna have an impact on the difference between the cost of an existing single family home, if you can find one, and the cost of a brand new home that's you know, just newly been built. And um, traditionally we think of a, of a brand new home being usually a more expensive, uh, a better buy than the existing home given location issues and differences and so forth. 
you know, but uh, so usually, you know, a new home would be a little bit more expensive than the existing home down the street, traditionally, historically, but that's quickly getting to the point where that may not be true any longer. Existing homes are selling at just as high as brand new homes that have just newly been completed. And I think that's going to put pressure on home prices in, in new construction. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, publicly traded builders raising prices because they can. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's another side of it, I guess, to look at. So we as potential buyers, homeowners, we're sitting back, we're watching the news and we're thinking, oh my goodness, are we gonna get any type of relief? I feel like I'm the only one that's struggling. And you think about, there are millions of people out there who one are looking for homes who don't have those 3% interest rates um, and is purchasing, you know, homes at the higher interest rates. Um, so it, it is possible there. And like you said, that the potential cost of new homes might increase, um, which can make these older homes uh, be more valuable and uh, attractive to future or potential home buyers. Now, let me ask you, Shannon, with these interest rates that we are hearing with the housing crisis, the inventory crisis that we're hearing, I mean, this didn't happen overnight. Uh, CNN published a really interesting story about the invisible laws that led to America's housing crisis. Um, it goes all the way back to the 1910s where cities started rolling out zoning laws. These laws help with the expansion of urban areas and protected American home values. But there were consequences that limited the housing supply and raised the cost of housing. Now local and state governments are turning to zoning law reforms to help with the housing crisis. Shannon, what are some examples of local and state governments pushing for zoning law reforms? You know, that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, I hear it discussed very frequently you know, with the government agencies, the GSEs and so forth. And, uh, you know, one really good example that uh, employees at Langrilla have, have heard me discuss in the past has been the general trend of um, the change in zoning regulations. A very good example would be the, in the state of California uh, that is a highly regulated state in terms of uh, land use development, zoning, new construction. Um, and it's uh, the, the regulations in the state, you know, have led to a lot of uh, limitations in expanding housing inventory. And probably the most uh, common um, uh, issue that is pointed to is the um, impact of the California Environmental Quality Act, otherwise known as CEQA, which was passed in the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, all with good intentions and good ideas, um, but it's led to such significant environmental restrictions on the development of land, uh, uh, changes in zoning, um, uh, requirements for green belts, um, easy for the general public to um, uh, protest or stop a future development. Uh, there's very many examples of housing developments in the state of California that have taken 10 to 20 years just to get wow. to the stage that they can start building houses. So, wow. so the, the, the big change here in California has been Senate Bill 9, which was passed by the California legislature, I think a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, I believe. And uh, it's intended to effectively increase the number of buildable units uh, buildable lots in the state of California by effectively making most areas uh, zoned multifamily. So you may have a single family 
home in a neighborhood that under the new law, you could either subdivide the lot, cut it in half, or you could build uh, accessory dwelling units. Uh, some people in California call it additional dwelling units um, to avoid a lot of the uh, planning and zoning issues that you otherwise would run into. And that's a, that's a quickly growing trend. It's not just here in California. It's moving across the country. And, and part of the reason for that is because many parts of the country have been slow to develop new infrastructure. California is a classic example of that. So if you split a lot in two, and now you can build another house, you don't have to you know, put in another road. You don't have to put in new sewer lines, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, that type of planning, you know, takes a lot of time and, and it, at a great expense. And so that's one way that the state of California, the legislature is trying to increase housing inventory in California. They estimate that it's gonna add another 870,000 single family homes in the mm -hmm. state within five years. If that proves to be true, that would be very significant. And so, uh, so zoning, I think that, you know, should be on the forefront of, of everyone's mind because, you know, that is really key to uh, expanding housing opportunities uh, for new construction. There's many communities in California that are surrounded by legislated green belts that prevent the construction of single family homes. And that's what they're trying to chip away at, you know, with zoning changes. So it's not just in California, like I said, it's, uh, it's really, it's, it's spreading all over the country. And um, so zoning, I think you wanna look for that. That's gonna have very significant changes in the future. And, you know, when you stop and think about, you know, we're five and a half million single family homes short for housing mm -hmm. inventory, you know, just think about how many residential lots are going to have to be developed over the up upcoming years to build new homes that were missing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no place to build those homes right at the moment because the lots have not been developed. Right. And some of that is from the zoning issue. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it looks like it, or from what it sounds like, it's a a great step forward. And, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, but if we have individuals or homeowners who are now able to add or put these additional dwelling units on lots that they have or properties that they have, I mean, doesn't that become like an, a passive income for them as well? Oh, it could be, certainly, certainly. And there's many people in California that have owned homes for many, many years, and they see it as an option to them, uh, adding uh, an additional dwelling unit, um, helps them not have to sell the house and move to Oregon or some other state. Um, and so, uh, yes, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, rental income, passive investment income, you know, I, I think, you know, is a part of that, definitely. Most definitely. I've seen examples of borrowers that have split a lot in half and built mm -hmm. units on the new lot and uh, two units on the original lot next to the original unit. And so um, that's all dependent, of course, on, you know, meeting building setbacks and you know, you know, basic zoning requirements. But I think the larger issue with Senate Bill 9, too, is that it's an attempt by the state to, to circumvent, you know, local control of the building process. In other words, you know, in Senate Bill 9, the issuance of that type of a permit for a lot split, um, that is a ministerial approval. That means that's an over-the-counter process you know, it's check the box and you sign it. It's not subject to an individual planner's discretion or opinion. You know, it's not like that. So I think that's that that says a lot, you know, and I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see the California, the state itself uh, attempt to issue the building permit uh, directly 
um, as opposed to the city or the county. There's been a lot of discussion about them doing that. And uh, you can imagine there's been a lot of local uh, pushback, but uh, I think it is, in some ways it's an act of desperation, isn't it? Because right. we haven't built enough homes. You know, we have legislation in place that prevents building of homes in California. Um, who would have ever thought, you know? Um, so um, those are really important changes. And uh, I, I, I track it and I, I watch it. And, you know, of course, Senate Bill 9 has been challenged in various courts and so forth and so far has held up. But, uh, um, you know, we no longer call them accessory dwelling units. We now call them additional dwelling units in the state of California. That's good to know. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you you've highlighted the pros and cons of the Senate Bill Nine, and that there are some opposition that's could, that's happening even locally. You know, just staying on topic here with with the government. Um, you know, in July there were Senators Thune and Morgan that reintroduced the Housing Supply Expansion Act with the goal of making reforms to prevailing wage requirements under the Davis Bacon Act. The bill aims to reduce labor costs and administrative burdens on residential construction contractors. Specifically, this would address the current requirement under Davis-Bacon that requires construction contractors involved in certain federally funded or federally assisted construction contracts to pay the prevailing wages of the area in which the construction project is located. The NHAB cites a recent Berkeley study found that the prevailing wage requirements raise construction costs by more than $30 per square foot, meaning the current Davis-Bacon requirements are increasing the construction costs by at least $27,000 for an average 900 square foot apartment which ultimately translates to higher rent. And I know there's so many people who can't afford a house, who can't buy a house, so now they're renting. Shannon, what are your thoughts on this bill, and do you think it will have an impact on growing the supply of affordable housing? Well, I guess that's a good question. Um, the Davis-Bacon Act is for federally funded projects and so I would imagine most of those would be in multifamily uh, housing or Section 8 housing or something of that nature. Um, so there's no immediate impact in, you know, in the private housing market. Um, I think it is a good idea because it does address the high cost of construction, uh, you know, when you have to uh, pay union-based wages. And... Um, and, and maybe it will have an impact on lowering the cost of non-government funded projects as well. Uh, you know, that's, you know, that's a possibility. And, you know, it, it does point to this, the larger issue of, you know, the overall cost of new housing, whether or not it's a, a multifamily apartment building or it's a single family home, you know, it does chip away at that issue about the cost, and um, I think the uh, NAHB, you know, would would estimate that the uh, the cost of a new home, the builder's profit, overhead, and supervision, could be as much as twenty five to thirty percent yeah. of the cost, and that's that's just the money going to the general contractor. And so you layer into that, you know, additional cost for labor, um, you know, under this. Uh, uh, revision that you're talking about, uh, that could be very significant, you know, in the long run. So I think it's a good move. Um, we'll see what kind of impact that that might actually have. Um, and we should probably query some of the general contractors, you know, what their thoughts are on this, because a big government project, a large apartment building, um, you know, that is funded with government grants or you know, direct government funding, uh, that can have a significant impact. You know, for most of the con construction that we see, it's it's not the in the multifamily sector. You know, it's single family construction or two to four family uh, construction, which would not be covered by this 
type of legislation. But nevertheless, it might it might have an impact on the overall cost of labor, you know, at a, at a time that, you know, in many parts of the country, we're seeing a lot of labor shortages mm -hmm. uh, you know, for skilled, uh, skilled people, carpenters, electricians, the framers, you know, um, there, there is a severe shortage in many parts of the country. And, um, I'm not sure when that is going to change. I, I don't know. I don't know what that's going to look like, but uh, this is why, you know, you're lucky to be a publicly traded builder because those those types of builders all control their own subcontractors, their W-2 paid employees for the most part. And so um, something to think about. You know, we've covered okay. and talked about you know, rising interest rates, rising costs. You know, we talked about how there are government is, um, initiatives to help. And in your opinion, Shannon, do you see some type of relief in the near future for, you know, potential homeowners, for potential bar, uh, buyers um, to be able to purchase a home, to be able to construct a home? Do you, do you see some relief in the near future? I, I don't see any immediate relief on interest rates right at the moment. I don't think the Fed is through with this cycle, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's tr while it's true that inflation has come down, uh, it certainly has not hit the targets of the Federal Reserve. And they've consistently said they're going to keep interest rates high longer. They say that at every Fed meeting. And of course, the uh, you know the stock market tries not to believe it. Um, so I don't see any break in interest rates anytime soon. It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me to see them go even a little higher. Um, I don't know when this interest rate cycle will end. I think it's all, you know, data driven, you know, how quickly does inflation come down? You know, we're seeing inflation, you know, continue to pick up in, in many sectors when it comes to food and energy, housing, you know, those are all very troublesome, unfortunately. And so I wished I could say I could see the Fed cutting interest rates, you know, soon. Uh, many economists hope for that. Um, but, you know, we look at these numbers that just came out today, today with uh, new home sales, you know, being at record numbers and increasing every, every month. Yet interest rates are elevated. They're up in the low sevens. And yet they're right. selling the heck out of them. You know, but I think what that misses is that misses the millions of people out there that are just not quite there in terms of being able to qualify for that higher interest rate, given what they're wanting, you know, in this square footage of a house. And so those people are going to sit and wait, I suppose, you know, you remain a, a renter, I suppose. And uh, that's not a good scenario. It's not a good picture, you know, and so... We're hoping for, you know, more sunlight, you know, in the housing market. And uh, what we're seeing is just, you know, more, a, a much higher pitch of activity in new home construction, renovation construction. And it all comes down to one thing. And that is that we have a national housing shortage. And unfortunately, there's not much government help on the way. Um, we, we don't see that, you know, so that's, that's probably not going to be there. And so I, we're hoping that we do see much lower rates of inflation. You know, if, if we do, then we will see the Fed be in a position to maybe not increase rates any further or actually cut rates maybe coming into, you know, the winter, you know, or the beginning yeah. of next year. I think that's, that, that's probably an optimistic outlook for right at the moment. And thank you for sharing your thoughts, Shannon. I know a lot of us, we we don't know where to look. We don't know what resources to believe in, to be able to hear somebody who is in the industry and sees these news, who keeps up with this news, and to really hear your, your genuine perspective of what to expect is something that is very valuable, I know, to myself and, and probably all of our listeners today. You know, earlier you did talk about how, you know, 
if you're a potential buyer, do not pass up an older home um, that needs some renovation. So let's switch topics back to renovation. Forbes had an article last week titled, As Mortgages Lock Homeowners in Place, Remodeling Comes of Age. Related to the lock-in effect we discussed earlier, homeowners have aging houses in need of repairs and upgrades and changing needs for their homes, such as when they get married or have children or move to an aging parent. Where are renovation loans going to fit in the future? Well, certainly in the purchase money market, you know, that's where they are. That's where they're going to be in the future because you're not going to see people want a, a new renovation loan at 7% uh, at the expense of paying off a 3% mortgage, you know. So the existing homeowner, I think they're going to they're gonna renovate the old fashioned way. And that's on credit cards and home equity lines of credit. Um, anything that they have to do uh, so as not to have to pay off the 3% mortgage. But in the purchase money market, we're talking about people that don't have that, that low interest rate mar uh, mortgage. And so um, that's where we're seeing that the change um, for remodeling and, and renovation. Uh, historically, there's always been a much higher percentage of properties that are renovated when the, when the loan is a refinance. But nobody wants to refinance now to pay off and pay off the three percent mortgage. Right. So we're seeing more and more uh, renovation loans that are underwritten as purchase transactions. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and so that's kind of new because we've seen in the past a steady decline of the FHA 203k program, but in 2023 that. Uh, that's not happening. You know, uh, FHA 203K loans are actually going up uh, month by month. And so um, I find that to be interesting because, and we, we know that most of those 203K loans are purchase money loans where the borrower is purchasing the house for the first time and use, utilizing the provisions of 203K to put the new roof on or uh, new kitchen or wh whatever the item might be that needs repair to make the house actually saleable. So, so I think that's something that is kind of a bright spot, uh, certainly for government lending for FHA 203k loans. Uh, we're seeing much more um, activity now when it's a purchase transaction. And I think part of the reason for that is that because the real estate brokers, the real estate agents, the real estate brokers have much more experience historically with 203k loans than any other renovation loan out there. And it did not come easy. I remember, you know, in the early years of my mortgage career, where FHA was trying to introduce this program and Realtors weren't buying it. No way, Jose, that mm -hmm. would happen, you know. And But slowly, the real estate, you know, market changes. It ebbs and flows. All real estate is local. Uh, slowly, the real estate industry itself found ways to utilize 203K loans to sell homes uh, that they have listed, but they needed repair items. And the sellers weren't willing to do the repair, so... That, that took many years, I think, for the real estate brokerage industry to sort of get behind FHA 203k loans, so much so that most of the boards of realtors actually have included addendums to the purchase money contracts that cover the needed information that would be have to be added to the sales price to cover the renovation. You know, they oh, have yeah. forms and addendums, you know, on, on, uh, you know, state specific forms and stuff like that. That's how far the real estate industry has gone. I don't know. I, I think a real estate agent would prepare a separate addendum if it was going to be a home style loan or something like that. Um, I'm not sure how they address it, but the real estate industry historically has, you know, experience with this and it makes it much easier for the loan agent to be able to work with an agent that at least understands 
you know, maximum loan to values and acquisition cost and, and you know, what's allowed, what's financeable, what's not financeable, um, uh, the, the use of, uh, uh, you know, outside agents that have to do the uh, project reviews and things of that nature, you know, so, uh, so I think that's a good thing. So we're, we're, we're looking forward to a lot more 203k purchase money business. And if there are lenders on the call that are FHA lenders, you should be listening up because this is something that many of you probably already have some experience in with the 203k lending. I mean, it sounds like as a whole, as a society, we are figuring out ways to make it through this tough time. Um, would you agree, Shannon? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Oh. And, uh, you know, it, it is a tough market, you know, but I would say, you know, when you're talking about construction to perm loans, you know, consumer construction to perm loans, those are very long-term planning projects for a consumer. You just don't decide to build a house one day and go out and start it the next week. It doesn't work that way. It takes sometimes many years of planning, you know, for a, to, to build your own home, a custom home, how to get building plans, how to line up a contractor, having to get the soils report, a survey, uh, entitlements, permitting, all that kind of stuff you know, can be very long term. So we don't very often see um, the borrowers um, obtaining a construction to perm loan and then decide to cancel or postpone it because uh, last week interest rates went to seven and a quarter from seven. Oh. And it's usually because that's a borrower they've been planning for six or seven years to build this house. Yeah. And many of them have been making payments on the lot for years and years. And so it's a long-term planning process. And so uh, interest rates do go up, interest rates uh, do come down. And uh, if we get some good inflation news, maybe we'll see, you know, rates, rates filter back down as we get closer to the end of the year. And as we get more news, I look forward to having many more conversations and highlighting the top five headlines that we see in the news um, in another uh, podcast. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Thank you so much, Shannon, for sharing your perspective today. And I know a lot of us listeners or those who see the media, anybody with it, within this mortgage universe, we can get into a state of panic because we may not necessarily know or see everything um, that experts like you uh, read on a daily basis. So it's nice to have somebody break that down for us. So thank you again, Shannon. Do you have any final comments that you would like to uh, share with us today? I don't think so, not for today. You know, and we're, we're looking for, uh, you know, maybe some sunnier days ahead when it comes to interest rates, um, you know, a lot of good things happening out there in the housing market, uh, you know, and new home sales being up significantly, you know, is, is a very important one that came out today. And so, you know, we're going to be digging down into that number and, you know, looking at uh, things like household formation. How is that impacting, you know, household formation has been going up steadily for, oh, at least the last uh, 10 or 12 years. And so that's a very, uh, has a very large impact on the demand for existing homes as well as new home construction. You know, when household formation is growing very, very quickly, um, you know, we, we all have to be looking for new solutions to the housing crisis. So I look forward to talking to you about these in the future. We have many more topics that we need to uncover and I'm excited to, to, to talk about them with you as well. You know, and to our listeners, if you have any questions or comments, especially if you have any questions to maybe Shannon for a future podcast that we'll be having, please feel free to reach out to us. We have a message line on the podcast page that we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you to our listeners for tuning in today. To learn more about Land Gorilla and solutions to construction loan management, visit us at landgorilla.com. Again, my name is Jamie Lee, and this is the Construction Lending Podcast.